the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District Board of Directors, staff and volunteers welcome you to the first in a series of public engagement opportunities to provide input on the features and amenities at the main entrance and district headquarters of Palo Corona Regional Park, sometimes referred to as the Rancho Cañada unit. We will welcome your input tonight and throughout this planning process. Tonight, we'll be reviewing the features for the dog park, nature play area, picnic pavilion, outdoor classroom, amphitheater, and connection trails, each designed to be universally, universally accessible by all user groups. All are welcome to the parks. The park planning is being guided by two teams, the west side of the park, including the picnic pavilion, nature play area, outdoor classroom, and amphitheater, by Greg Yanito, lead principal with Paige and Turnbull, and Beth Mott from BSF, BFS Landscaping Architects. The east side of the park, including the dog park and Cal Fire emergency staging area is being led by Julia Oberhoff, Principal Landscape Architect and Candace Wong, Principal Project Principal for 10 Over Studios. The meeting is being conducted in phases. First, each team will provide an overview presentation of the featured concepts. Next, you will be provided the opportunity to give input and ask questions in the format, format of breakout rooms hosted by the presenters. Then we will return to the large group Zoom room to report back some of the highlights from the breakout rooms. And finally, we will identify the next steps and ways you can stay involved. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District General Manager, Dr. Rafael Payan. Dr. Payan has been with the district for seven years. As a visionary leader, he was instrumental in obtaining the 185 acres of the former golf course. He guided us through the GDP or general development plan process and has brought us to where we are today. So without further ado, Let's work together to plan your park. Raphael. Thank you, thank you Jackie. Good evening all and uh, thank you again for joining us. And um, a little bit of history as we go back. Palo Corona Regional Park was acquired originally in 2004 by the Monterey Regional Park District. Uh, this natural area and open space is approximately 4,700 acres in size and it's predominantly a natural area. However, this natural area has served many functions um, besides uh, being an important wildlife habitat. It's now an important scientific research area as we uh, explore the effects of climate change from the coast to about a 4,000 foot elevation. Uh, we're also looking at the site uh, for its historic content. Uh, the Monterey area is that the Carmel Mission, the very stone that was used to construct the Carmel Mission came from Palo Corona Regional Park, was quarried uh, by the uh, indigenous peoples there for the uh, Spanish crown. Um, the uh, northern boundary of Palo Corona Regional Park is roughly about one mile east of Highway 1. And it extends uh, as a crow flies uh, for almost 10 miles uh, with its southern boundary being uh, in the Big Sur area at Garapata State Park. Um, in 2017, uh, the park district acquired the Rancho Cañada Golf Club. And this acquisition was something that uh, greatly benefited this property. As Jackie mentioned, this 185-acre addition um, into this uh, site. And again, we're, we're going to be calling it the gateway several times tonight, and that's exactly what it is. Now, the Rancho Cañada unit, just like Palo Corona Regional Park, has seen a lot of human activity. In fact, um, the Rancho Cañada unit, which we'll be discussing tonight and some of the improvements upon there, has been used by humans for about 10,000 years. It was the original homeland of the Esalen, the Ohlone, and the Rumson indigenous peoples and people before them as well. Later in the last 150, 200 years, almost 300 years, it became an agricultural site. It was an area that was grazed by 
uh, Spanish and Mexican land uh, grant, uh, ranchers and farmers, and, lately, and, and later became a dairy farm. And after it became a dairy farm, it became the, uh, one of the first areas in the United States to actually see artichoke fields, artichoke fields and such like that. Well, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, this and this uh, 36 hole golf course was one of the premier uh, public courses in the United States and still um, has vestiges of that. And we're gonna be working over the next 20 years in restoring this former golf club into a natural habitat. So again, that's a separate project, but it interfaces beautifully with uh, the projects you will be hearing about uh, tonight. As I mentioned, uh, this, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, this uh, former golf club is now uh, the gateway to Palo Corona Regional Park. <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, about three years ago, the general development plan for this property was undertaken by the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District. After several years of research and many community meetings, we gathered public comment to what the public wanted to see at this site. Um, and we were looking at it, what types of facilities, what kind of uses from in looking at this property, in addition to habitat uh, conservation and the restoration of wildlife corridors as well. Once completed, uh, the general development plan was then um, analyzed under the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA. And we're glad to report that uh, the CEQA analysis was completed and the project is fully compliant with those requirements that CEQA establishes for development and especially those that are in proximity to or within the coastal zone. Um, uh, and thankfully, uh, uh, we've been working with uh, several parties and the bulk of the projects you're gonna see tonight, in fact, that what you're gonna be hearing about are outside of the coastal zone. Now, tonight we're gonna be focusing as Jackie mentioned, uh, on two primary projects at Rancho Cañada unit. As Jackie mentioned, the West unit is also going to be known as the, is also known as the uh, Gateway Project. And the e East unit is uh, the property that is going to be home for the uh, uh, dog park, an incident command center, and uh, other impro important improvements for this site. In the interest of time, I'm uh, gonna hand this off to Mr. Greg Anito and uh, his team. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to your input. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your evening for, to join us here to talk about uh, two exciting pieces of, of, of planning a, a new park for, for the Monterey Regional Park District. Um, my name is Greg, I'm with Page and Turnbull. I'm a planner and a project manager and I'm going to talk about the west side of the park, which is, as Rafael mentioned, the gateway site um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the concepts for some of the program pieces and uh, Beth Matz from BFS is also going to join this conversation a little bit to talk a little bit about the landscape elements and some of those concepts. Um, as Raphael mentioned, this used to be a golf course and so there's a lot of really interesting golf amenities left over from its former life such as berms and greens and sand traps and of course, a, a pond that's probably filled with a lot of golf balls. But nonetheless, what we wanna do is kind of orient you first. The part of the site we're talking about is approximately 16 acres, just west of the parking lot um, and adjacent to the Discovery Center. Um, and it's intended to be the front door to this new park um, or a gateway. And the last time you probably have seen this was about three years ago during the general plan update project and a concept plan with some program elements came out of that effort. And what we've done up to this point is kind of look at those approved elements and um, we're starting to look at them a little bit more closely um, to bring them, you know, bring some of this to fruition. And so the first piece that we've done up to date is look at the entry plaza and the restroom building, um, which in this slide here is right in the middle of the drawing. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, 
we put together a, a, a quick rendering just to kind of illustrate where we're starting from with, with this to show the first investment and the first in piece of, of investment is this, this new restroom building in Plaza. Um, but where we are now is we need help from the community to move beyond this and, and start to look at the rest of the 16 acres of the western side of the park um, and talk about what the community really wants in terms of some of the features of the park. Um, if you can go to the next side, please. Um, I'm going to talk about three different pieces um, that are that that are intended to be park amenities. The first of which is a series of picnic pavilions, and these are really just uh, inspirational images for you. These are not concepts that we're proposing yet, but we're looking at materials and form. And the goal really is with with these structures is to provide a light and airy structure that does not does not compete with the natural landscape. It's something that would frame views or just provide shelter, um, but not, not be in contrast with um, the great surroundings of this beautiful park. So what we're looking at is just some materials. We wanna get your feedback on the types of forms, the type of materials, and, and ask some questions about how the picnic pavilions would best suit your use of the park. Next slide, please. The second, the second um, element that we want to um, get some feedback on you is, is for an outdoor classroom, which is another approved element for, for the park. Um, and this is an educational piece that we, we want to talk about, again, materials that are compatible with, with the park and the language that's consistent, but again, not distract from the natural beauty of the site. So the materials that we're beginning to think about and would like some input on are natural textured uh, materials that have a granular feel, um, wood, stone, concrete. And if you go to the next slide, please. The third architectural element that we want to talk about tonight is a potential amphitheater at the site. Something that would work with the site, built into the hillside, something very natural, built into the terrain, that would provide passive performance or passive recreation. And again, the purpose of today is not to present a final concept to you, but to prevent, pre present some ideas and get some ideas generating and really get some feedback on these things. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth, who will talk a little bit more about some of the natural features at the site. Thanks, Greg. Um, my name is Beth and I am a uh, project manager associate principal at BFS and a couple of the exciting park program features we wanted to talk about tonight were the um, planning for a new playground at Palo Corona and the district's vision and the community's vision is to have a playground that really accomplishes two things. One is something that's nature-based and then um, another priority is that that it provide universal or all access. And so what I wanted to present tonight were just some ideas about what nature play and an inclusive all access universal playground can be. And so when we talk about nature play, what we're really thinking about is how can we leverage some of the natural materials that you may find, um, whether it's out in Palo Corona or an open space and bring those more into a playground type setting. So we look at using things like boulders and logs and materials like rope, things that have natural elements and that children can really start to develop a tactile relationship to, as well as provide some opportunities for them to start developing motor skills and to start looking at developing other childlike behaviors such as socialization. So on the next slide, we look at maybe some of a larger play equipment that we would find in a nature play. And this is more conducive to a five to 12 year old. But again, you can see the value of when you take these natural materials and you're able to assemble them and create these sort of structures, it really allows for children to explore and to expand their imagination. And that's really one of the benefits of introducing a nature play type and playground. The other part of our playground is the universal or all access. And so on the next slide, what you'll find is 
what is universal? What does all access mean? And that has really evolved in the last few years to be something more than just providing ADA compliance. When we talk about all access and universal, we're talking about playground experience that are able to attribute to both children who may have modality issues or may have um, disabilities, but also maybe children who are on the neurodiverse spectrum. And so we work really closely with playground manufacturers and with children who, um, child behavioral specialists to create these sort of playground environments that include everybody. And so when we talk about usually all access, one of our priorities is just showing and encouraging side by side um, equal play experiences. And so on this side, you'll see both different types of swings and different types of zip line elements that allow for children to interact together. And then on the next slide, one of our big pieces is just the socialization. And I think by the district's prior, um, sort of vision of marrying both the nature play and the universal access component together, this is really gonna become a destination playground. So we're really excited to get the feedback from the community. And we're really excited to learn about what your priorities are and what you're seeking in this new playground at Palo Corona. So in addition to the universal playground, and we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the site elements that might be around the playground, whether it's shade or seating. As caretakers, um, we want to acknowledge that a lot of your time is being spent here in the playground as well. So what are your priorities? What do you look for when you go to a playground? Those are things that we want to consider in the playground design. Then the next kind of piece to our play, our park is really interpreting nature. And as you're going out into the open space and you're exploring Palo Corona, there is so much to see and there's so much to take in. On a daily adventure out there, you might come across a bobcat or you might actually see fish swimming down the Carmel River. And so we want to bring that habitat interpretive experience more close to the Rancho Cañada unit core. And so what we're looking at is hopefully creating and leveraging the existing irrigation pond and revitalizing that <coughs> and revegetating that to create a more native habitat. So at one point, maybe this pond becomes a place for wildlife and biotic species to actually be close by. And so on the next slide, we look at taking around, looking around the edges of the pond and can we introduce things like interpretive signage and nesting boxes for the local um, birds and raptors and introducing that around the pond and providing there to be a little bit more of an interactive experience for visitors to really engage with the Palo Corona native habitat. And so what we're looking at from the community is what are the things that you're excited about learning about at Palo Corona? What are the things that really bring your interest here? Um, what are you wanting to explore when you get out into those open space environments? And then the next slide really just has to do with the park character. It's really important to make sure that the design and the park-like setting that we're creating at Rancho Kenyatta really fits within the Palo Corona sort of overall experience. And, you know, the district and the design team, we really see that as being a very natural like and using very natural materials that complement the existing open space. So we would like to hear a little bit more from you folks about maybe vegetation and planting and what it is that it's so unique and special about Palo Corona that we can start to introduce within this park core area. And then last but not least, um, one of the goals of the district is 
is to create a pathway system, pathway system that is conducive to both pedestrians as well as folks who may have accessibility issues and accessibility challenges. And so we're looking at feedback on what sort of trail system or pathway system do you see here in the park core that will start to provide some linkages between the different project and park sites and create some connection to the open space. And with that, I'd like to introduce Julia to talk about the dog park area. Well, and um, thanks for taking the time to attend this virtual community meeting. Um, I'm pleased to be part of a team from Tenover Studio that's working on the east side of the Rancho Cañada um, unit here and its improvements for um, both large and small um, dog parks. The graphic that you see in front of you right now illustrates again on the east side of that main parking area, um, the locations that we've proposed for a two and a half acre large dog park that's uh, illustrated there towards the north and then a half acre small dog park, which is just to the south of it. Um, we were working, uh, as, as Raphael mentioned, you know, and, and everyone or most are, are aware, this used to be a fully functioning and um, golf course. And so we are working around some of the existing uh, amenities and infrastructure, one of which is the golf cart pass that were there. And so the planning and placement for these uh, dog parks is working around um, those paths as well as other amenities such as the existing um, operations and maintenance buildings and um, as Raphael also mentioned the the need for um, the incident command center so which would be an intermittent use. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about the um, proposed elements for the dog park. Um, so Intermittent throughout both uh, the large and dog, uh, small dog parks are a, a collection of proposed amenities um, that are listed there on the left-hand side of this slide. The first of which is um, making sure that our entrances and exits in and out of the dog parks are um, safe and um, accommodating to the, that transition between on and off leash. Um, so we've got uh, double entry vestibules for both of the parks. Uh, there are also um, located throughout the parks are a series of proposed shade structures. We'd love to get input on you from you as far as um, if you even think that shade structures are um, a desired element. And then we'll look at in, in upcoming slides at the different types of shade structures. There will also be um, water um, filling stations and water drinking stations, as well as waste receptacles and recycling receptacles. Um, and then the entire perimeters of each of the parks are um, fenced in. So the, you know, we're overall, we're maintaining um, the general goals of, you know, safety for your dogs, community building, um, relatively, you know, ease and maintenance, but at the same time, um, long lasting water wise, and um, as I said, safe. So I'll show you in the next few slides here, a couple of the specific elements um, within that we're proposing and we would love input on. So shade structures, there's a whole number of different um, approaches here. There's a couple of slides that give you some look and feel uh, about, you know, the uh, an open wood pergola structure that might have filtered light versus shade sails that might give you a bit more, um, you know, contiguous shading. Um, again, similar to what Beth was mentioning, a lot of this is we're trying to suggest things that um, support and align with the the character of Palo Corona and the Rancho Cañada sites. So. Um, We'd love your input on the shade structures. Um, and then next, uh, a, a key element to dog parks is the surfacing. Um, there's a number of different options there um, from natural mulch or a synthetic park, park mulch to um, portions that could have pea gravel or decomposed granite, which is a crushed rock material. 
Um, and then in, in heavier use traffic areas, uh, you know, concrete walkways. So, and a park doesn't, cert doesn't need to have, you know, one service across the entire park. It might be a collection of different materials depending on the, the, um, the location and the size of the park. Uh, there's also the opportunity for natural play and agility elements. So those could come in the form of boulders or um, repurposed logs um, that obviously are, you know, safe for the use of agility, um, stump elements or things that the, the dogs can have fun with and socialize um, at the same, but at the same time, you know, maintaining good uh, sight lines for the owners and um, safe play. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, waste and trash receptacles are an important thing to have. Um, maintaining a clean and healthy dog park. Um, water is obviously a key element for um, the dogs and visitors. Hitching posts for your leashes. Um, it's it's important, you know, to to stay organized and stay stay you know in, in touch with what the the dogs are all doing. And then, um, you know, opportunities for benches for those who want to sit and um, keep watch of their dogs from a perimeter versus those who are maybe a little bit more, you know, engaged. And then um, contiguous perimeter fencing for safety. So um, I guess with that, I'll just uh, lead it into. Um, well, I'll let Savannah talk about how uh, the uh, breakout groups are gonna work out, but that's the extent of the dog park elements. Thank you, Julia. So at this time, we want to go ahead and give you all the opportunity to discuss and kind of brainstorm ideas um, on both of these projects. And we'd love to hear your feedback from that. All right. So if you have a different preference, let me know. Otherwise, I think we're just gonna stay in one group so there's no need for the breakout uh, rooms, which also means that now we have to determine who's gonna be our main facilitator. And um, since Greg, you're on, on the top of my list, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you go first. I'm ha happy to facilitate. Perfect. So, um, Thank you again for, for listening to our presentations. And as Savannah mentioned, this is um, your opportunity to give us your feedback and what you've seen so far or other thoughts that you might have. We have listed five questions here at the bottom of this slide to um, start the discussion. Um, and so if, if you have no other burning questions that you would like to ask, um, I'll start with number one and just ask, how do you feel that this park design fits into your idea for, for Palo Corona? And don't all talk at once. I think that the only, the only thing I've seen so far that kind of stuck out to me was the, um, some of the structural pieces I thought were really interesting looking. I think we want to be sure we're careful of the view shed from the road and also from the rest of the park. Um, I, uh, and yeah. Uh, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> Yeah, and the and the one the one just before the, the just the shade structure one, yeah. Um, I kind of like number six, but you know other people may have different preferences. But um, particularly if we're going to have str shade structures in the dog park, we want to be really careful because I've lived here all my life, and people will comment on <laughs> on, on almost everything, and uh, you'll find out if they don't like it, I guess. But um, but just be, be aware, I guess, that it should be probably be low profile or blend in really well, if that's possible to do. Um, that's a great a Can great you go comment. back to the amphitheater one? Yeah. 
Um, those, the smaller ones, uh, particularly, I think number three and maybe number two, um, I, uh, and maybe four also, um, those look appealing to me. Um, I think the other ones are a little big, but maybe that's just a scale thing. I don't know. Great, great comments. Yes, and they are purposefully larger just to show the range of, of um, how this could be implemented and what, you know, gauge some reaction to not only size and material, but form as well. So that's, mm -hmm. that's great input. Okay. Uh, do you have any comments on the outdoor classroom element? Well, again, I mean, I think again, just something that will will blend in. I think blend in. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I don't know. There's, it's hard to tell, sort of, from the pictures. Most of them are are really close up. Sure. You see how, what they're what they're like from a distance, but and some of them look like a little bit a little bit much. I don't I don't know. Um, you know, if we need something like number four, that looks like. Mm -hmm. It looks like we should be serving wine or something. There. <laughs> um. Exactly. <laughs> um, so let me let me go back to your comments on the picnic pavilions. Um, you, you're mentioning you, you mentioned a few times over about size and blending in. Um, you know, the picnic pavilion could be large or small. Um, what size of groups would you envision using? The picnic pavilions you know is it a group of four people is it a couple is it a large birthday party of two dozen kids i mean um just just your your initial reaction to that i, I think you'll get all of those um okay we we have you know you know i work there so i know who comes and who's, who comes and visits uh, we do have groups occasionally that want to come out there and there are student groups that I'm sure would, you know, hang out there or or use it as a staging area for whatever they're doing. And I know there'll be people that are just onesies and twosies, or maybe fours, four people coming to have just, you know, quiet picnic lunch. Right. So I think you'll get it all. I yeah, I think we'll have all of those. A question that I would have, I. I'm pleasantly overwhelmed by the entire presentation, and I thank you for that, both on the east side and the west side. There's a lot to take in. But to answer the question, I would also like to consider, will our Let's Go Outdoors uh, all age groups be perhaps using, whether it's um, the classroom or the picnic areas, as an additional meeting place? So it's children of all ages as well as adults. And the versatility of each of these spaces I think is key. And if we were to encourage larger groups, we need to probably think about reservations. Is that appropriate? Uh, what happens, um, you know, in terms of com competition of using it, competition of, uh, I don't mean in, in a, aggressive way, but just in the demand. So I think the people who would be using it for our formal programs, um, the student groups from the school areas, as well as perhaps Let's Go Outdoors, what are their particular needs versus exactly what Deborah was saying? All of us, whether we're bringing grandparents or grandchildren or young children, or we're just coming ourselves with a few people, I think less is more in this case. We have an absolutely magnificent natural setting. And I think something that will be able to be maintained in a relatively easy way, used in the most versatile way possible, and the fewer things that could get broken, fallen over, and so forth. So I think I'll stop there. Um, but. I, I just love the whole idea that we get to talk about all of this, that it's actually going to be happening. And I'm thrilled with that. Fantastic comments, thank you. I'd love to just chime in, um, Tempe, on the heels of your comment and just say that 
One of the things that we're continuing to work on is the connectivity between the east and west side elements that we've presented here tonight. It may have, the presentation might have reflected that there's you know, there is sort of that separation between the two, but I think that's one of the things that we're continuing to develop. So just wanted to make that comment as well. Okay, thank you. And just a quick announcement to the other folks that haven't participated. Um, if you're having trouble finding your mute button, it's at the bottom left-hand corner of your either mobile device or your uh, computer screen, you can toggle that on and off. Or if you don't feel comfortable speaking out loud, feel free to type in the chat any questions you might have. Was part of the question regarding the walking surfaces on both sides, all sides, were we including that in this portion of the discussion? Both sides, mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I would just vote for maintaining, again, a, as much versatility as possible. So many young parents with strollers, people with various capabilities, canes or other walking devices, the width, so important, we certainly um, recognize that from the pandemic, but just to allow people to pass safely, keeping the sight lines very open. So the mowing that will continue and at the same time to have as much natural uh, surroundings as possible. That's what people love, whether they're going to be going up to Inspiration Point or just doing the loops or just sitting and watching their children play to have this variety of surfaces, but to do not give up on the golf course, uh, concrete trails, footing during rainy season when we are blessed to have it is much better. And so I'm hoping what I'm hearing is the concrete uh, golf trails for the most part, golf cart trails for the most part will remain. And these would be additional, possibly what I'm seeing, um, decomposed granite, possibly packed earth, possibly, um, I mean, I can't tell what they all are. Is that assumption or request or combination there of um, what I'm understanding is going to happen at this point? Yeah, yes, Tempe. Um, we're currently wanting to look for sort of a material palette, like you talked about, that complements what's already there today. And so, you know, the materiality of that South Bank Trail where they're using the uh, stabilized DG, that's something that we think could be really utilized up towards the clubhouse and up towards the kind of this park core area. And then, you know, if we're able to leverage some of those existing cart paths and maybe just build onto maybe an edge of the concrete with maybe like a wider shoulder, that's something we want to look at as well. Um, and kind of build upon some of that existing trail networks that are there. But we, I definitely hear your comment about making sure we have paths wide enough so people can pa um, pass each other and as well as pe um, paths that are kind of durable to our, to our rainy season. I'd like I would like to ask um, Tempe or whoever would like to respond is, you know, what feature that we've presented this evening, you know, that is of most interest to you and would bring you back on a regular basis? Or is it something that we have not presented? I have to wear all my hats, having lived in the area for 51 years. As a young parent, then as a, you know, grown adult, then as a grandparent, as a walker from age 28 to now 78, I really 
am looking at it from all those mm -hmm. aspects because they're people that I know, family members that I have. And I think we have to keep, especially in the area we have, we can't forget our seniors, we are, that that's the heavy part of the demographic, but we have more and more young families. We want to encourage more students, more young people to be out here. So that's why the answer has to be, I love looking at the playground options <laughs> because I've, I've been, been in places where they're so great or they're so terrible or they're dangerous or they're so absent. Um, that, you know, a child, no matter how skilled you are, unless you have Jackie Nelson as your accompanying person, you might <laughs> not be able to grasp their attention on just, you know, a, a walk. Um, and so I think that's what I see in everything that's been presented, including the dog park, that I feel the invitation to come back does span the generations. And I'm thrilled about that. And because of my longevity, um, I'm, I'm trying to see it from all those levels. So thank you for, for asking that specific question that I answered in a, a broader, a broader uh, perspective than you actually asked me. Really, this is wonderful feedback. Thank you. Um, is, you were saying something about playgrounds and some are great and some are not so great. What makes a great playground? Well, that's an interesting concept because when Garland first opened and my daughter was young, we were encouraged to allow them to play on the historic farm implements. Mm. And it was terrific. It would not be allowed now. It would not be recommended. It's probably not at all safe, although, you know, people I was with, we were always very vigilant. But I think it does need to be thought about in terms of the youngest children. When I'm out walking every day right now, there aren't particular places to play, but you see the two to three year olds loving to just run around and fall down on the, on the lawn where it's, it's green, it's soft. They can toss a ball, they can have fun. I noticed in the presentation, you talked about, I think it was, I don't know, it was five to 10 and then, then older maybe, I've got them uh, not quite correct. But we need to make sure we're thinking what is appropriate for kids. Mm -hmm. And hearing it as a destination point um, or destination park, I, I love the idea, but I think we're gonna have to be careful to nuance that. Older kids, I'm not sure how much play ground they need versus other kinds of nature experiences in the park. I'm not sure that that's as appropriate. Um, we're not a playground like the school playgrounds. We're not Toro Park where people go and there's swing sets, even though I love all of those parks. So have we thought about age appropriate um, sort of guidelines, how many 12 to and over do we want to really encourage to be in those play areas versus really gearing them to younger students and younger children. I'd love to be opposed with that. I'd love to have an opposing view. But my sense is the older kids are more engaged. We're going to, I understand, have a running, you know, uh, cross country or some sort of running areas. There are certainly lots of nature interpretation areas. There are other kinds of classes and projects. So my, my tendency would be to really be looking at the, you know, two, three, four younger group, and then maybe five to 10. And that would be my emphasis. But again, I'd love to hear someone else to speak up who's, you know, has, has, has a different perspective. Excellent comments. Excellent. Um, or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great input. Thank you very much. And and Beth did a really nice job kind of 
a green with that concept. And so it's great, it's helpful to have public input on that, that we're looking you know, for two to four to get those cognitive skills and the motor activities and the socialization and then five to, uh, to 10 to get more of that socialization and equilibrium and that that's what the park need, you know, the play area needs to be. There's other opportunities, like you stated so eloquently that, you know, they can do the running trails or they can do the hiking or they can do wildlife viewing. And, and so thank you. Yes, I agree. I, I did, I did want to say the one, one playground element that really caught my eye was that slide. And I know mm -hmm. it, was, it was in, it was part of something else, but, um, where did it go? Um, it was like a steel, shiny, there you go. That that looks appealing to me. I, they had something like that at Dennis the Menace Park, and maybe they still do. Kids just, like, they were lining up to go on it. Um, and anything that involves climbing, um, kids naturally gravitate towards, I think. I, I know I did, and, and my son did when he was younger. Um, I kind of like that uh, wood rock climbing structure. It looks fascinating. Um, you might have a little bit of a challenge keeping the, the creepy crawlies that you don't want in there from being in there, but, but I, I, would, I would gravitate towards that as well. Um, and it's natural looking. And yeah. So rocks, rocks and wood and slides. Well, I, I heard you say natural looking. So you're, you're really thinking that it's natural elements that's incorporated. Yeah, I did, did, I mean, I don't know, you know, whether they actually are real pieces of wood or if they're, you know, made out of other things, but they, it looks like a natural, um, a natural thing. And so it, it doesn't, it doesn't jar the eye in a park. One thing that um, Beth had mentioned in her presentation is, is that when we do look at the playground area, we have to think of it holistically and, you know, what does the caregiver or the parent do while the child's out, not the two or three year old, but the, the older ones out playing, you know, the sh what, what does the shade look like and what's the benches look like and, you know, how, how um, close are they? Do we have shade structure over the elements? Mm -hmm. That's important. And, and also, I would say that because I know, I know, I think I know where this is going to be more or less. And, and, and that would inc also include the, um, the classroom area. It can be quite windy there, um, mm. especially in the afternoon. It's just a prevailing wind sometimes that doesn't stop. And it might be more pleasant for people <laughs> if there was some kind of windbreak. Good point. Excellent point. We have, we've heard that comment a lot in the last two years, and we've witnessed it firsthand being on site. So thanks for bringing that up again, um, because we, you know, we're definitely paying attention to the natural, not not just the shade and the solar angles, but the wind is, you know, definitely something that that we're keeping in mind too. And another question we'd like to hear from from audience is um your kind of your take on the amphitheater you, you know we heard a little more salt smaller scale you know is it is it natural seating is it fixed seating what kind of events do you think we should be targeting maybe kind of an overview of your reaction to this hmm. the the ones that I, that I pointed out that I liked that were, um, they were kind of tiered and they looked like they were like, a, they, the ones in the pictures looked like they were lawn. I don't know if we ha can do that because of the water, but um, mm -hmm. then the, the seating could be either bring your own or mm -hmm. could be, you know, we could provide it maybe or some, we could, if it was some big important thing, we maybe even could rent it, but people could be encouraged to bring their own seats and, um, and as far as what kind of uh, what would go on there, um, I, I don't think we want to have anything like we don't want Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, much as that, much, oh. much fun as that would be. <laughs> <laughs> I would go if we did, but, <laughs> but um, you know, 
Shakespeare maybe or, or uh, school uh, plays um, or dance demonstrate and if there's enough room and, and you know surface um, things like that uh, that could be go, that go on. Um, I, d I doubt if we're going to be doing lighting, although I don't know that for a fact. So it'd probably just be daytime um, mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of what I what I envision, like small kind of concerts. Um, and I don't know, maybe you could even have it open for people to like um, rehearse or practice as long as it wasn't like loud. <laughs> yeah. Great. And we'd want to consider it becomes a play structure when it's not being used as an amphitheater. Yeah. So it's it's just going to be there and it's not going to be able to be resisted. So to just keep that in mind, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but some of the materials and the slope, uh, if it was concrete, if it was, you know, sharp edges, Again, I'm just seeing it, it's right would be in, as you enter, you have young children. We have no restrictions right now on movement of families or, you know, people. So just keep that in mind, because I love the idea of an amphitheater. It's a very ancient, you know, symbol of a community coming together. I think it could have many uses, but I would certainly want us to also think if it's very steep, if it's very, um, it needs to be child friendly or and or equipment friendly. It just is mm -hmm. going to be a major structure as some, I saw in some of the folk, uh, the pic pictures that were put up. I'm sure you're keeping safety at the top of the list, but maybe it could be a fun play structure if in fact it was designed with that in mind as well as a performance or a place for Let's go outdoors classes, a small, you know, lecture, a small event, everything that Deborah mentioned. I'm all for it. But remember, it's just, it's going to be there even when it's not being used as an amphitheater. That's, that, that's an excellent point. And um, let's go outdoors has been mentioned several times. What, and we're looking at the classroom as well as the amphitheater. And I'm, I'm such a pro proponent of multi-use, you know, things that can be used for a lot of, lot of different uh, purposes. But what would these features need to really accommodate a Let's Go program? I mean, do we, do we need a solid flooring? Do we need sidewalls? Do we need water? What, what, what makes it a enticing for Let's Go? In the amphitheater itself or just anywhere? I, the amphitheater and the, um, the classroom, the oh. proposed classroom. Well, I don't know, I, just off the top of my head, I would say that if of the two, the classroom would probably be more likely to need water. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would kind of see the amphitheater as something that where people plan to go there. So they would probably be able to bring their own whatever with them. And I, and that was, as when you guys were talking, I was thinking, well, people might want to walk over there and have a picnic there too. Even though there aren't, doesn't look like there'll be tables, it doesn't mean people can't have a picnic, I guess. So definitely, I think if that, if it does turn out to be a draw for just the general people, we probably need to consider having like trash receptacles there for sure. Um, well, and what we love about Let's Go Outdoors is, you know, there's no confined type of program. I think if we have facilities and options, you know, a, a Let's Go Outdoors, you know, a, a presenter, a group, an idea, it will come and it will fill it, you know, build it and they will come. I think there could be many adaptations of, you know, past Let's Go um, let's go outdoors ideas, but the sky's the limit from what I've seen. It's, it's been tremendous and it will only grow and be enhanced, I think, by these other options. And especially we remember too that not everyone can take a long walk 
or maybe have the ability to um, be in a group, even if it's not a major hike, even just a walk. So perhaps a more um, a place to sit and actually listen or to do a small projects. So I think between the classroom and the amphitheater, I think it could appeal to a lot of different age groups and a lot of different kinds of activities, maybe people who haven't been able to participate, you know, for various and sundry reasons. So. Excellent points. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. So you had mentioned about not being able to walk um, very far or, you know, wanting to have a um, a shorter distance destination. If we moved over to the dog park area, you know, what what would entice you besides, um, you know, the ability to let your dog roam free, you know, to utilize that dog area? Is it shade? Is it benches? Is it trees? Is it dog? First, I'd have to have a dog. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> But, you know, what would entice you to go over there, maybe to check things out? Yeah. Well, I, I know for once it's built, I'm going to go over there and watch people play with their dogs, probably. Just, um, and I do, I do think this, per, I think, I do think there needs to be seating. I don't know for sure if there needs to be shade. Um, probably not a bad idea to have at least one place that's shady because, you know, we get, we do get a few days that are warm. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm about to say something that might be controversial though. <laughs> Deborah, I think what you, just by saying you're, you don't have a dog yet, it makes me realize too that, you know, seating inside and outside of the park itself is really important. So for people who do want to just come and watch, you know, the different dogs, they can do that. Yeah. And they don't actually have to get into the mix with them and have them jumping all over the place. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess what I was I was going to say was that if it, if it if you know if I was going to do it and, and name it, I would say there's there's a large dog park and a smaller dog park and not focus so much on the size of the dogs that are gonna be in the parks, but the size of the parks themselves. Mm -hmm. And cause it, I mean, I've, I've, I hike all the time. I'm in Garland like every weekend and I'm at Palo Corona almost every day now. And people come and they have multiple sizes of dogs themselves. And, you know, they may have like a little terrier and they may have a golden retriever <laughs> or something, you know, and that does make, it, it, you know, it's kind of like, well, what do you do? You leave one of them, what, in the car? Or you put one of them in the dog park and leave it there and go to the other dog park? I mean, it, it just, I think if your dog is ill-behaved, it doesn't belong in either dog park. If it can't, you know, if it can't behave itself around other dogs, you shouldn't, they shouldn't be in there at all. And so I think that the size of the dog park is more maybe about how much, you know, what you think your dog needs or what you are comfortable with, how far away that you're happy with them being able to be from you, um, mm -hmm. and whether they're good about coming back. I don't know. You know, I just the size, the, focusing on the size of the dog mm -hmm. is kind of I don't know. That's what I meant. That, that what I said it might be controversial, but and especially since I don't have a dog, so I'm not really I don't have a dog in the hunt. <laughs> That's okay. I think That's that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was just going to say, sorry, Julie, to interrupt you, um, that another important part is just um, rules of engagement or sort of etiquette, you know, and that, that sort of, it wasn't presented on, but I think that goes without saying that that would be an element, you know, incorporated into both of the parks is mm -hmm. sort of setting the, the stage for, yep, use. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing I, that occurred to me, and I don't, I don't, I, I haven't heard what it, what if any, you know, plan there is about this, but this particularly in the larger park, when you're talking about the surface, um, I guess if the whole entire surface was going to be surfaced with something, or even just wood chips, that would likely, you know, kind of take care of this, but there are an awful lot of, of stickers and other kinds of things that get stuck in dogs. I used to have dogs and, <laughs> 
and taking one to the vet to have a, a grass on yanked out of its eye or its ear or its nose is not fun and or cheap. And um, I think we want to be at least be aware of that. I mean, people, hopefully dog owners are aware of it, but we don't want to be like uh, facilitating that to happen to people's dogs. I, I would just add one general comment because I know time is running a little bit short. I was very impressed with the survey that the dog park people, um, the staff and everyone have put together. I did not take it because I, I do not have a dog at this time, but I have had many dogs. It's very detailed. I think a lot of, if you are able to get a good response, I think a lot of these details will be, um, you know, coming forth, I hope from the results and the group that did the original planning staff, as well as volunteers, it seems to me they've been very thorough. So I'm hoping that plus, you know, listening to our rangers, you know, you know, how, who's, who's going to maintain it and take care of it. And it sounds like a lot of that groundwork is, is happening and it's in process. And I'm really, I just say, thank you for ha having that detail organization and the survey opportunity for people because um, it's it's a if you haven't looked at the survey just read through it it's very I think it's very well done thank you thank you for for your comments and you know thank both of you for for sharing um, you know this was really the purpose of this uh, presentation is to start some dialogue and hopefully we'll continue this um, over the next month um, and, you know, I'd like to ask at this point, is, you know, is there anything else you'd like to share with us that, that we haven't asked you? Well, and let me just say, I'm going to pick Grace on the spot. Grace, you have a dog and you're, you've been part of this. What would you like, what would you like to see in a dog park? Hi, Jackie. Thank you. Um, <laughs> actually, my dog is, uh, he's right here. He's uh, tune in for it. So he's, um, he's got some commentary also. Um, I think I loved the ideas of the, um, the, the nature play elements for the dogs. I think that would be, that would be really fun to see sort of like the mounds and dogs running up on the mounds and boulders. And, um, I think that would be like a really fun, unique element that I've never seen at a dog park before. So I think that would be, um, allow them to have sort of creative play, um, as well. I think, I think uh, shade elements and places to sit for people is super important because um, a lot of being at a dog park is, is um, being social as a dog owner as well as your dogs getting to be social. Um, I, think, I think the, um, you know, the size of the dog park is really important. So the two acres, um, you know, and making sure there's a good enough um, run and length for, for dogs so they don't feel cornered or, or trapped um, and sort of avoiding corners in the, in the layout, which it looks like you guys have done, um, mm -hmm. is really important to, for, you know, dog behavior and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, um, um, I think having sort of a mix of, of te textures and surfaces, you know, some grassy areas and some mulch or like DG or whatever and then some planting sort of mixed in so the dogs can have you know things to run in and out of but there's still good sight lines so you can keep track of what the animals are doing um are um I, I think it keeps it interesting for for the, the dogs and for the people um in that space but yeah this is really fun to see how the plans are developing you guys did a great job um really wonderful presentation um I had just two other really quick comments, if that's okay. Um, yes. um, so uh, when talking about the, um, the structures, um, like whether it be like the, you know, the um, sort of shade structures or furnishings, um, I think that whatever route you go with, um, it seems like this project might be installed in phases and it wouldn't all be sort of necessarily developed all at once. It might kind of happen gradually. Um, so I think whatever you decide, just um, choosing some sort of consistent approach to, um, to the, the look of the, 
the structures and the um, furnishings and the other um, physical elements. And if there's a way that um, like design guidelines can be sort of set up, so any sort of future projects have design guidelines laid out. So, um, you know, there's some guidance on what sorts of furnishings and other fixtures to select when a new project gets funding to be installed. So um, the park can keep a really consistent and clean look. Um, I think that would be um, a nice um, sort of planning forethought for that. And then um, the last comment I had was just about the amphitheater. Um, I'm not sure if there if there's still thoughts on using the amphitheater for um, like weddings, um, if that is going to be potentially a ceremony space as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just wondering about making sure there was um, like access from where the uh, wedding party is going to get ready and sort of the banquet area and making sure there's a direct route from that area and that back lawn behind the banquet area to wherever the amphitheater, amphitheater is. Um, if, if the park desires the amphitheater to be used for wedding ceremonies, just making sure there's a better route that is a little more direct and maybe a little bit more private. So it's not like the whole wedding party has to traipse through the trailhead and then go down to the, to the amphitheater. Can, they can have a little bit more of a direct route um, um, just for ease of access and, and getting all the guests to that spot, um, I think could be a, um, a nice way to, to keep that programming element slightly separated from the activity that's going on in the public park. Excellent, excellent. Um, really Thanks. appreciate your comments. When you, um, Grace, when you were talking about the dog park structures, or actually you went into the structures and about design guidelines, were you saying for the overall, um, both sides? Yeah, east? Yeah, for the park overall, east. I think whatever you decide on is the vision or like for the either the structures, the materials, and I think it sounds like you're starting to do that um, in you know, collecting these images um, and getting community feedback. Um, and uh, um, I think the further you go in the process and the more feedback you get, you'll start to narrow in on, on the types of furnishings and the types of structures you wanna use. And, and maybe um, as you collect that information, there's a way you can just create a short, um, you know, one or two page of design guidelines for um, future projects. So, so everything can just have a, maintain a consistent look. As, as projects get installed, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now. Well, not to mention the, the architecture that already exists on site. So in keeping with that as well. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Is anything else, anything we didn't ask you that you would like to share? Nothing that comes to mind at the moment, but you guys did a great job. It's really fun to see this project develop. I can't can't wait to go there someday. Oh, great. Um, any anyone else? I didn't want to cut anybody off. Um, that would I want to say thank you. Really, it was a good opportunity to to see everything and hear, uh, you know, some of the plans. Great. Well, thank you. I think at this time, I'm going to turn it back to um, Savannah. Is that correct? Yep. We do have about eight minutes left. So it's perfect timing to mention when our next event is. So our next event will be an in-person open house at Palo Corona. Um, we hope that you all will come to join and tell everybody about it that lives in the community. That way we can get their feedback too. Um, we have all kinds of ideas for this particular thing, like craft tables and other tables that will display some of the same pictures and ideas, and hopefully we can get some textures out there, and you can actually come to the site and vision with us on Saturday, July 17th, and that'll be from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. right at Palo Corona, and the address is right down at the bottom. Um, I think most of you have probably been here that are on this call, so... Don't need to belabor that part, but definitely um, stay up to date on social media and, of course, our contact information here. Um, you can always visit our website. We'll be updating the website um, with this recording for this particular meeting, as well as any new and updated information 
So definitely visit there first. And if you have any questions, feel free to email info at mprpd.org and make sure to include the subject line, plan your part. That way we know um, the what subject your, your questions are geared towards.